Church in Malaysia. Why don't we welcome him, Pastor Albert Isaac. Thank you. you. Praise God. First of all, I want to say a big thank you to Pastor Sam for the privilege of coming and ministering the Word of God uh, to all of you here today. And I believe that today, um, if you've come expectant, you're going to receive. Come and look at the person next to you and say, expect. Yeah, you, you can do better than that. You can say, expect. Amen. Amen. And the more that you expect, the more that you will receive. Amen. And today, I'm, I'm on a, I just want to challenge you to look beyond where you are today. Because God is a bigger God. Our God that we serve is bigger than anything that you can ever go through. And I just want to also welcome those of you watching online today, uh, wherever you are. I pray that God will speak to you and encourage you and bless you. Uh, before I go into the Word this morning, I want to give Pastor Sam a little gift. Uh, it's my, my book that I share with all of you today. I, I couldn't bring a lot of copies, so Pastor Sam gets the real copy. But all of you get the online version. So, it's on the screen, right? I, I had it this earlier today. Just go to our website, whcmy.com, and uh, uh, just download your free copy. It's an ebook, and this book is on a, all about joy. T the title is Help, I Need Some Joy, Finding Joy in Times of Adversity. And uh, there's a lot of amazing stories in there, faith stories of how God came through for me, and uh, some of those things I will share with you today in this message. And my prayer is that you be blessed. All right? So get a copy for yourself. Get a copy for your friends. Share it with somebody. Give it away. Uh, it, this book was meant for you. Amen? Amen. Well, before I, I go into the Word, I want to ask my dear wife, Pastor Stephanie, to come. Just say hello to everybody for a few moments. Yeah? To greet all of you. This is my, my wife, Stephanie. We are, yeah, we, we are, we have been uh, married for a long, 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 long time. Uh, and uh, uh, more than 30 years. Uh, and uh, we have uh, three children. Um, as you can see, I'm, I'm Indian. My wife is Chinese and uh, our children are Indonesian. Yeah. Look at my daughter there. I think she'd fit right where, right with all of uh, all the Indonesians. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, we have, we have three children. Zoe over here is our youngest. She is here uh, going to Hillsong College. And uh, uh, my eldest son, uh, he is now, he's got two children. Uh, so we've got two grandchildren with us now. And our second daughter, Laura, who lives in Singapore, she is expecting her first baby in September. So we're, we're blessed. We're blessed. Uh, and so, yeah, have a word. So I'm very excited that you have a, Young adult service, isn't it wonderful? And uh, I can see such great future upon each and every one of you. You know, I always tell my husband, I love what God is doing in our midst. Um, we were once young adults. <laughs> I don't know how we got into the senior group. <laughs> we were once young adults. And, um, you know, in my country, we have this institutionalized racism, okay? Uh, some of you may, may know this, you may not know this, but in our country, it is legislated that if you're Chinese or you're Indian, you don't get privileges like certain other races do. So uh, if you buy a house, you pay 100%. Some of the, one of particular race gets a 7% discount or a 10% discount. And then uh, in terms of going into colleges and universities, we have got a quota system. That means if you are either like him or like me, uh, you don't get into university, uh, though you have good results, so you look for private ones where you pay a bit more. So we work very hard to educate our children. So I'm very excited to see so many young looking faces here. Now the wonderful thing is that even though you are in Australia, you have an identity. I was talking to my husband that, you know, the greatest thing that we did with our three children was to affirm them of their identity. Firstly, who they are in Jesus and whose they are in the Lord. 
That means we are children of God. We belong to God. God is our Father. Our children belong to God, and so we know who we are in the Lord and we know whose we are. Whatever it is, we grow with a purpose and a destiny in our lives. So, you know, our children love the Lord. They are serving Him, and I'm excited that even here, you know, I can see all of you are growing in the Lord. Just keep growing. Just keep moving forward. Just keep, you know, seeing your tent enlarge and and you fulfilling your purpose and your destiny in Him. All right? So God bless you. We're going to have a wonderful service. Amen. Thank you. I, I just want to encourage all of you. You know, I am a firm believer of the next generation. That's you. You are the next generation. And I want to just encourage you that you hold the keys to the future. And God has given you those keys for you to take his kingdom to the next level. And I, I have a bunch of great young people in my church. Uh, I love them. My church is f- actually full of young people, a lot of young people. We have, we have older ones like me too, but the older ones also are young because we are young at heart and our minds are young, you know. Uh, see, I'm, I'm a granddad, but I, I, don't, I don't feel like a granddad. I feel like a like a young person, because I love, I love doing great things with the young people. And I want to say this to you today. As God has placed you in this church, catch the vision of the house. Catch the vision of this house from your pastors. Catch the vision of the house, because when you catch the vision of the house, what happens is this, is that you will make it your own. And when you make it your own, then you become a builder of God's kingdom. Amen. You have a great purpose here. So don't ever think of yourself as just coming to church or just attending church. But see yourself as a builder, a builder of God's kingdom. And never despise your youth. You may be young. I came into the ministry when I was 18 years old. So I, I started serving God really young. I was a law student doing my law degree and God called me out, left everything, came to serve Jesus. And I've been doing this all my life. And so, you know, there's nothing better than serving Jesus. And I mean, not not that everyone is called to be a full-time minister, but whatever it is that you're called to, you're first called to be a child of God. Amen. And so I want to encourage all of you before I go to the word today to see yourself as God sees you. Because God sees you as men and women, young men and women, full of potential. And the saddest thing in life is that most people don't use their full potential. You know that, you know where you find uh, people with most potential? In the graveyard. They're dead. They're dead. Because they never used most of their potential. Scientists tell us that Most people use only 10% of their potential in their lifetime. I want to challenge you to change that, to reverse that statistic and begin to be a builder of God's kingdom. Use the potential that God has given to every one of you. Every one of you has a great, great future. This church has a great future because you are here. Look at the person next to you and say, because you're here. This church has a great and awesome future. Amen. All right. So you ready for the word? Okay, I, I'm going to tell you something. I love a lot of noise. So, so I don't know. You're not old people, right? You're young people. So it's okay to make a lot of noise, right? So I love to hear loud amens. Yeah, yeah. I love to hear voices, you know. Uh, when, you, when you agree with something, you know, you can shout. You can say whatever you want to say as long as it's not a bad word, okay? We're in church, okay? But, but I want you to feel free today to respond because God is here. And the Bible says wherever the His Spirit is, there is liberty. So we, we are, we're free here today. We can, we can shout out when we, when we agree with something, when something is spoken. 
and, and it blesses you, shout out and agree with it. Say amen. Amen? Amen? All right, that's better. That's better. You're getting there. In a little while, you get warmed up. I know it's cold outside, but it's nice and warm in here. This morning, I want to talk to you about mountain-moving faith. Say mountain-moving faith. You know, the Bible tells us that without faith, it is impossible to please God. And if there's one thing that many people struggle with, it's this area of faith. Because some people say, well, I don't have enough faith. Oh, you know... Uh, that, that, that pastor over there, you know, he, he raised the dead or, or he, he prayed for the sick and the cancer was healed and so on and so forth. Wow, but, but I don't have that kind of faith. Let me tell you something. Faith is not measured by how big a faith you have. Because the Bible tells us if anyone who has faith as small as a mustard seed, you know, Biji Sawi. Have you, have you seen a mustard seed before? It is tiny. But the mustard tree is not tiny. It's a big tree. And, and so the Bible tells us, if you have faith as small as that, small as that, you can say to the mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea. And it will happen. Amen. In, G, in Mark chapter 11, verse 22 to 24, Bible says, and Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God. In fact, in the original translation of the Bible, it is, it is translated as have the faith of God, which means the God kind of faith. Did you know that God has faith? He's faith in you. Amen. And, and He is the originator of faith. All faith comes from Him. And so today, the Word of God tells us that Jesus answered them and said to them, Have faith in God. Have the God kind of faith. For assuredly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, Be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that the, those things which he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Amen. Therefore I say to you, Whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. So the Bible says when you pray for something, when you're believing for something, when you're hoping for something, when, you are, when you're trusting for something, the Bible says believe that you already have them. In other words, you've got to start visualizing yourself. You've got to start seeing yourself having it. If you're sick in your body, then you've got to see yourself healthy. Amen. If you're, if you're lacking, you don't have enough finances, you've got to see yourself provided. You've got to see yourself differently today. Amen. I want to challenge you to start seeing yourself the way God sees you. God sees you as His favorite child, His favorite son, His favorite daughter. And God has a good plan and a good purpose for you. So don't ever think small of yourself because God doesn't think that way about you. God never thought that way about you. God thinks highly of you because you are His favorite son and daughter. He created you for a great purpose. He created you for big things. Big things. You know, when, when my son was first born, uh, he was born in Singapore when my wife and I were pastoring in Singapore. Many years ago, over 30 years ago, we were there. And, and my son, when he was born, I remember, you know, bringing him home. He was just this little, tiny baby. But every night, I would often go into his room where the bed, I mean, where his crib was. And I would just hover over him. And I would just look at him. He's asleep. When I look at my son, I used to dream big dreams for him. I dreamt big dreams for him that he will become a great person, that he will fulfill his purpose, that he will become all that he can be for God. I dreamt those dreams when he was a baby. Yes, as he grew up, uh, my wife shared in the earlier service today that, you know, he, he didn't really want to serve God. But one day he had an encounter with God. 
and that changed everything. You know, when he was when he was younger, he 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 had long hair, and uh, I used to joke with him. I said, "Do you want to be like Jesus?" You know, he had long hair. He, he loved his long hair, uh, and uh, I mean that was his identity then. And my wife used to tell me, "It's only hair." Relax. He's not doing anything bad. It's just hair. So I got over the hair business. And one fine day, I, I went up to him and I said, Daniel, I'm fine with your hair. You can keep your hair as long as you want. If you want to keep your hair right up to here, go ahead. I'm okay. I'm all right. Yeah, even if you want to sweep the floor with your hair, go for it. No, I mean, it's going to take a long time to get there. But, but I, I said to him, it's okay. It's fine. And just as I said that, and, and with all honesty, I was not trying any reverse psychology on him. I was just saying, it's okay because mom says, mom has said to me, it's only hair. Right? So, chill, you know, relax. So I told him, I said, you can, you can just have your hair. And the next thing is, like what she said earlier, he comes up to his mother and says, can I, you know, I borrow the car keys? I want to go cut my hair. So, after he cut his hair, that one time, he's never grown long hair again. So, <laughs> but, but, but what, what, what am I saying here today? He had an encounter with God. I mean, it's not about the hair. But he had an encounter with God that changed his heart. And his heart became tender towards God. And as a result of that, he one day came to me and said, I, I, I believe God has called me to serve him. That was my greatest joy, to know that he was now going to dream and live those dreams that I had for him. God has dreams bigger than what I dream for you. So don't ever think small. But it would require us to believe God for it. It would require us to trust God if we want to see those dreams come to pass. Amen. Abraham Lincoln once said, faith sees the invisible, believes the incredible, and receives the impossible. Can I say that again? Faith sees the invisible, believes the incredible, and receives the impossible. So if you are going to trust God today, then trust Him all the way. You're going to believe Him? Believe Him all the way. Don't, don't, don't go halfway and then say, oh, it's, it's not happening, so I give up. No. Don't ever give up. You keep going on. You keep standing in there. You keep believing until it happens. Whatever it is that you're trusting God for. I, I don't know what you're trusting God for today, but I'm sure that in this room, every single one of us is trusting God for something. It may be different from one person to another. But for sure, we're trusting God for something. We're hoping. We're believing. We're waiting. We're expecting. And so I want to challenge you today not to back down on your expectation because God is not done with you yet. Three things today about having mountain-moving faith. Number one, faith is holding on to God no matter what. No matter what happens, you hang on to God. In the book of Habakkuk chapter 3 and verses 17 and 18, the book of Habakkuk says, Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vine, though the labor of the olive may fail, and the fields yield no food, though the flock may be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. And I will joy in the God of my salvation. Basically what Habakkuk is saying is this. He's saying, I've tried everything. Everything fails. The fig tree does not blossom. Amen. There's no fruit on the vine. The labor of the olive has failed. And there's no, uh, uh, and, and, and the flocks are cut off from the fold. And there are no herd in the stalls. He said, when all of this happens, he says, yet, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. And I will joy in the God of my salvation. That's the kind of faith that Habakkuk had. When all else fails, I'm going to trust you, Lord. I'm going to hang on to you. I'm going to hold on to you. Incidentally, Habakkuk's name means to cling on or to hold on. 
or to hang on. And Habakkuk lives out the meaning of his name right here in this scripture where he hangs on to God. Are you hanging on to God today? No matter what happens in your life, God wants to carry you through. 27th of October, 2001. I was, I just finished a crusade in, in central Java, in uh, Samarang. I was on my way home to Malaysia when I received news that my church building had been burnt down. Gone. Some, some fanatics came in that morning, early in the morning, uh, looted the church, took everything of value and set the building on fire. We had been building the church for about seven years at that point of time. And just suddenly everything was gone. When I arrived in, in Kuala Lumpur, I arrived to devastation. I arrived to a place where we had lost everything. Everything that we had worked hard for was gone. Can you imagine? In just a few hours, everything was gone. That afternoon, I was at uh, the police station and the police were interrogating me for four hours. A long time. You know, it's like, it's terrible, right? When, when, when you didn't do anything wrong and they interrogate you like you're a criminal. Making it look like you must have something to do with this. And after they had finished interrogating me, one of them asked me a question. You've lost everything. Everything. What's your response to all of this? And I said, well, we've chosen to forgive the people who've done this. and We choose to move on. And the guy asked me, how can you move on? How is it possible? And I, I thought to myself, you kept me here for so long, treated me like a criminal, and then now you ask me this question? I, I had to preach to you at least for one hour. And so I, I, I started sharing with this police officer why we choose to forgive. It's because Jesus first forgave us. Why we choose to go on? Because we don't hold it against these people. Whoever they are, I said, your job as the police is to do your job. We, we leave it to you. You do what you need to do. But we will not seek revenge. We will not look for ways to, to hurt other people. That's not who we are. And so that day, after I, I shared with them the gospel in the police station, the, the policemen changed towards me. Suddenly, they became friendly. Yeah, they became friendly. And they said, oh, you know what? Don't worry about anything. If there's anything, you know, just let us know. It's our personal number, direct number. We'll take care of you. And oh, I said, this is so different. A while ago, I was the bad guy. Now I'm your friend. And so I sat in there. Uh, um, and after they, they had let me go, I, I went home. On my way home, I heard God speak to me. Because I was talking to God in my heart because I, I didn't know how to deal with this situation. You know, when I went to Bible school, there was no class. You know, that said, what do you do when somebody burns your church? You know, like step one, you do this. Step two, step three. I, I, I didn't have any such thing. Nobody taught me how to deal with this. It's not something you learn. It's something you go through. And when you go through, God carries you in that situation. And I, I remember feeling so lost. As a church, we have been very involved in church planting. At that point of time, we had planted over 100 churches in the Philippines. We had planted churches in Indonesia. We had planted churches in, in, uh, uh, in Burma. In, uh, in, um, and now we have churches in India and in Dubai. Uh, these are churches that we planted. But back then, we were heavily involved in church planting. And as a church, we never really um, had a lot of money in the church because whatever we received went out. You know, we, whatever came in went out to some ministry, some missionary, some pastor, some church. It was always supporting the work of God. 
we, we always had enough, but we didn't have a lot of reserves. So when this thing happened, we didn't have anything. Instinctively, I knew we had very little in our church bank account. Definitely not enough to start all over again. And we needed a miracle of God. And so I was driving back that night when God spoke to me. I said, God, what, what do I do? And I heard this voice of God so clearly. He said to me, when what you have is not enough for what you need, then what you have becomes a seed. Can I say that again? When what you have is not enough for what you need, then what you have becomes a seed. The God, and, and the Lord said to me, sow it. Sow it. And so what we did was, we decided to sow the money. So most of our income, our, our, our money in the church account, we gave away. And when we came the next day, we borrowed a service, a, a, a church facility of our friend, and we had a service there. I can still remember this. Uh, that, you know, the, the week before, we had hundreds of people coming to church. But that day, we only had like 30 plus people coming to church. Can you imagine? You really know who's with you when you go through a trial. When you go through a trial, suddenly you see who's really standing with you. We had a couple of hundred people and now we had only like 30 people coming to church. Some of them were afraid. Some of them were judgmental. All kinds of responses. But on that day, it was a very sad service. It was more like a funeral service. Everybody was crying. Everybody was sad. And then, you know, I told the people, we need, the first thing we need to do is we need to forgive the people who have done this. They cried. And then, and then I told them that we have decided that God has spoken to us that we are going to give away most of our finances. They cried even more. I I think, I think that some of them would have thought, yesterday we lost the church, today the pastor's lost his mind. You know? But I took that step of faith and we gave it away. And then the miracle started. See, my dear friends, when you hang on to God, no matter what happens, and you obey His voice, God performs miracles. When I was walking out of the church that afternoon, a pastor of another church around in our community, I saw him across the street and he was running across the street to come and see us. And he said, where have you been? I've been searching for you today. Because, you know, nobody knew where we were. We, the church building was burnt down. We just borrowed a facility of our friend just to gather. We didn't announce where we were. So he was searching for us, calling everywhere, finding out where are they? And he came across the street with a plastic bag and he said, Pastor, today our, our people in the church gave this offering for your church. The miracle began. It started there. And from that day, God provided for us through sources unknown to us. He, he provided supernaturally for us every day. We saw his hand at work, providing, 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 until today we have our own building. You know, you know the, the, the irony of this whole story is, when we had hundreds of people, we could only rent. When we had 30 people, we bought two factories. How about that for a move of God? Amen. Amen. Come on, give God the praise, would you? That's what it means when you, when you obey God. You just hear that small voice in your heart. God says, do this. You do it. You don't be afraid. i would never done that before. But that day I did it in obedience to the Lord. My wife and I, we both agreed and we did it. And God came through. What's God speaking to you today? Amen. What's God saying to your heart today concerning the things that you are believing God for? Nothing is too hard for the Lord. 
Amen. So number one, faith is holding on to God no matter what. Number two, faith is not by sight. It's not what you can see, but it's what you can believe God for. That's what you will see. If you cannot see something today, it's, it's because God's not done. But when you exercise your simple faith, just believe Him. The invisible will become visible. Amen? The hidden will become obvious to you. You will begin to see it happen in your life. The Word of God tells us in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7, For we walk by faith and not by sight. We walk by faith, not by sight. So I want to challenge you today. Don't look at your circumstances, but look beyond your circumstances because your circumstances are hindrances for you to see what God can do. Because God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that you can even ask or think. That's how God is. That's how big our God is. My prayer is at the end of this service that your faith level will rise to a level that you've never seen before. That you will begin to stand together with your pastors here and you will believe for bigger, better, greater things in the future. That you will believe that a supernatural uh, uh, move of God is coming to your church. It's going to sweep through your church. It's going to fill up every seat in this church. It's going to give you a new building. It's going to give you a new facility. It's going to give you so much resources to bless the kingdom of God. To make a difference in the lives of people. Do you know that during the pandemic, in our country, there was a, there was a season when, I mean, we, we couldn't have church. We, everything was online. But there was a, a situation in my country that, that happened. We began to read in the news. There was this white flag movement. What is this white flag movement? Basically, what it was was that uh, many people who lost their jobs and who didn't have even basic necessities, just food. They were struggling. But I don't, know, I don't know about Indonesians, but Malaysians are very proud people. They don't want to tell you, hey, you know, I don't have food. You know, I, I, I really don't have any food. They don't want to tell you that. So they suffer in silence. But for some reason, during the pandemic, people were so desperate that somebody started this movement called the white flag movement. What happens is that if you have in, if you're in need or if you don't have enough, you just tie a little, even just a handkerchief or whatever, or put a stick out your window. And so when people pass by, when they see a white flag, they know that house needs help. Go help them. And you know something? Thousands of white flags all over our city. Thousands of it. And as a church, we, we, we were saying, how can we make a difference? How can we help them? And so God put into our hearts that we need to feed the poor. Feed those who are struggling. And so we started a feeding program. We started a feeding program. It was, it was just crazy. We, we just sent out a message to all the people in our church and said, hey, we're going to do this. If you want to help, you can just contribute towards it. And, uh, you know, there's no, no ability to collect an offering or, or give. Or, you know, it was just online. Everything was online. I said, if you want to do that, give it to us. And somehow God began to provide. I got a, I got a food supplier. I got a, a, a wholesaler to to give us the food supplies that we needed. Our goal was to feed a family of four for a period of two weeks. Enough food for two weeks. We started the process. We said, we're going we're gonna to give out food on a particular Saturday afternoon uh, at one o'clock. We have enough for 500 families. So, you do the math. 500 families times 4 in a family, that's 2,000 people on that day alone. 
So we announced it. When we arrived at the church, we with our with our volunteers that morning, we, we arrived at something like eight o'clock or something. Uh, the police were around there because because there was such a huge crowd that gathered. People were lining up, and they were queuing around the block, far beyond our church facilities. And you know, the, uh, it was it was becoming a spectacle. What's going on here? And we heard that from 6 o'clock in the morning, people were gathering. That was how desperate they were. They were so desperate. We fed them that day. We were so sad that some people went away without receiving. Because we only had 500 families worth. Then we did it another time. Two weeks later. And then we did it another time. And then we kept doing it until we saw the red, fl I mean the, the white flags uh, movement kind of died down because people were getting food. In about a span of four weeks, we had fed over 10,000 people. That was just one. And then there was another place where we saw uh, an apartment building where they were all locked down. They couldn't get out. Somebody heard about this and they wrote to us. They said, we cannot get out. Can you bring some food to us? We dispatched another batch to them. We helped our, our community to feed the community. Hey, I want to tell you this. You can make a difference. You can make a difference for Jesus. On that day, you know, in Malaysia, Muslim people will never come to the church. Never. They say haram. They will not stand on the ground that the church is on. But during this time, you know who were mostly the people who were lining up? Muslim people. They came and they received from the church the love of Jesus in action. See, what I'm saying to you today is this. It's not by sight. But you, when you apply your faith, you, the things that you cannot see, the people, the lives of these people, can you imagine the impact the church can have when you just trust God? You know that during that whole couple of weeks period that we did this, all the needs were met. All the needs were met. Over a hundred thousand ringgits was given towards this purpose. For a church of our size, that was a lot. But yet, we saw God move. Finally today, faith is focused. In the book of Matthew chapter 14, verse 22 to 33, I'm not going to read the whole passage, but I'm just going to summarize it for you. Matthew 14, 22 to 33. The Bible tells us about this incident where Jesus walked on the water. The disciples were in the boat in the middle of the Sea of Galilee. Jesus came walking on the water in the night. Now, it's, it must have been a... a a dark night. Must have been a windy night. Must have been a foggy night. And it, from what the scriptures tell us, the disciples thought that he was a ghost. When they saw him walking on the water, they thought, is that a ghost? Because they've never seen anything like this before. I mean, if you, if you see something like that, you probably think the same way. It's impossible. This thing cannot happen. But yet it was Jesus. But there was only one person in that boat that dared to speak out. And his name was Peter. You know, we know Peter in the Bible. He's the guy who sometimes says the wrong things at the wrong time. You know, he, but he was full of zeal. He, he really, really wanted to experience something. So the Bible says that Peter says, Lord, if that's you, beckon me to come unto you on the water. And the Bible says that, Jesus told him, come. 
See, on the words of Jesus, his word come. Peter became the first man to defy the forces of gravity. Before man walked on the moon, Peter stepped out of that boat and became the first man that walked on water. How amazing is that? Peter, a fisherman, he didn't have a lot of education. He didn't get a PhD in physics or something to calculate how he could walk on water. He just stepped out of the boat and he walked on water. He became the first man to do this. And I don't think I've ever heard of any other person doing it after him. He walked on water. The Bible says as long as his eyes were fixed on Jesus, it was okay. But the word of God says that at a point of time, he saw the winds and he, and he you know, he, he saw the waves and he heard the winds. And he took his eyes off Jesus. And his eyes were on the circumstances around him. The Bible says he began to sink. And Jesus, of course, came and rescued him. Brought him into the boat. The rain has come. Brought him into the boat. That simply means you can't go anywhere. You have to stay in church. I'm just joking. Yeah. And, and, and Peter, after Jesus rescued him, Jesus said to him, why did you doubt? Why did you doubt? Why did you doubt? See, my dear friends, many times you can be in the midst of your miracle and then you stop short just before God carries it through. God's doing something. Peter was enjoying this. He was, come on. I don't know about you, but I would love to be in Peter's shoes. Even if I could just do that for a few minutes, a few moments. Supernatural. I've been to the Sea of Galilee. Me and my wife, we've, we've been there. We've been on the boat. We've seen, my goodness, you know, it's not, it's not a shallow uh, a lake. It's deep. But here was Jesus walking on the water and he called Peter, come on, come. Peter was walking on the word of Jesus. What is God speaking to you today? When God says come, you come. When God says go, you go. When God says jump, you say how high. Amen. Because on that word, the miracle will take place. On that word, the supernatural will be shown to you. Let me close with this today. I want to tell you about someone I know really, really well. Someone I'm very well acquainted with. He was 17 years old and he was a student of the military academy in my country. One Saturday afternoon, he came back from military training and went to his room. And uh, uh, he was getting ready to take a shower, put a towel around him. And just as he was about to leave his room, he felt dizzy. And he felt like the whole room was spinning. And then he fell backwards. And as he fell backwards, uh, his head, the back of his head, hit the, the metal bar of the bed. When he hit the metal bar, he fell to the ground. He could not open his eyes. He could not speak. He could not move. He had no sensation from his neck downwards. He had lost all sensation from his neck downwards. He was paralyzed on the floor. He couldn't move. He couldn't call for help. This is a young man who was very athletic. And he felt so helpless because he just didn't know what to do. He couldn't speak. He couldn't call for help. But he could hear all the sounds around him. He just couldn't respond. He couldn't open his eyes. He was on the floor. Lunchtime came. His friends came, knocked on the door. He said, hey, let's go to lunch. No response. Friends thought he was asleep. So they went to lunch. Three o'clock that afternoon, about three hours later, they came back again. All this while he was on the floor. They came back again. And 
They knocked on the door and this time when there was no response, they were really concerned because this guy would never not respond. At least he would say, you know, go away, I'm, I'm sleeping or, or, you know, I'm fine, I'm not going to go for lunch or something. But at tea time, at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, they came. He was not responding. And so they found a master key, unlocked the door, they came in and they saw him on the floor. Immediately they called for an ambulance. An ambulance came and took this young man and brought him to a nearby military base hospital, a small hospital. And there the doctors attended to him. The doctors tried to, to revive him. They, they, they couldn't do anything. He, he could hear everything that was going on around him. All, the only thing that he couldn't do was move. He couldn't move. He couldn't open his eyes. He couldn't speak. While the doctors and the nurses were, were treating him, he heard somebody say this. Oh, he's got a temperature of 107 degrees. And another one says, oh, even if he survives, He'll be a vegetable. He'd have suffered brain damage. He won't make it. It's better that he doesn't live. This is what he heard someone say in that room. When he heard this, from the depth of his heart, he cried out to Jesus. He said, Lord Jesus, help me. I don't want to die. A few moments later, he slipped into a complete coma and he didn't know what happened after that. Several hours later, his heart stopped beating. He had a cardiac arrest. The doctors rushed in again and tried to revive him. They tried to do everything they could. But at midnight that night, they declared him clinically dead. He was dead. They had kept him in that in that treatment room for another hour or so. And then they prepared to put him on a, on a, a, a metal bed. No mattress, because dead people don't need mattresses. And they covered him with a sheet, a thin sheet. And what they decided was, since it was very late in the night, and this was a small base hospital, they decided that, and they didn't, they didn't have a, a proper mortuary facility. They didn't have freezers there. They said, we'll send the body early in the morning to the main hospital where they have the freezers. In the meantime, we'll try to contact the family who lives in a different town and we'll put this body in the next room. We'll turn on the air conditioning really cold, leave him there until early in the morning, 5 o'clock, the, the ambulance driver will be ready to take him to the other hospital. And so they left him there. He's dead as dead can be. Five hours later, the nurse, the ambulance driver is ready. The nurse comes, unlocks the door. And when she unlocks the door and she opens the door, she turns on the light and he opens his eyes. This young man looks at her and then she looks at him and then they both scream. I know. She, they scream and they scream. She screams, he screams. He has no idea what's going on. He doesn't know what's happened. He doesn't know that he's been dead for five hours. He has no clue. All he knows is he opened his eyes. And this nurse, she was so terrified, she slammed the door shut, locked it and ran away. And he could hear all the commotion outside. She's screaming. She thought she actually saw a ghost. Really. And so she went away to the doctor, called him, the doctor who was there the night before, and said, hey, you need to come now. That boy who died last night, he has become a ghost. I saw him. He opened his eyes. He looked at me. And, and she, she, she said, if you don't come now, I will go crazy. I'll lose my mind because I saw. The doctor said, don't play tricks on me. It's not the time to do that. He said, no, you, you've got to come right now. So the doctor said, come down, come down. I'll come right now. In the midst of all of this, this young man was looking at himself. He was naked. He had no clothes on. Dead people don't have to wear clothes. Only had a sheet, thin sheet covering him. It was freezing cold. And he, he was in shock. He doesn't know what's going on. 
He has no idea why this crazy nurse is screaming outside there. All he knows is he's in this very, very cold room. A little while later, the nurse comes back with the doctor. He arrives. He opens the door. He comes in and he sees this young man. By this time, this young man has just got this sheet and he's just, you know, kind of trying to wrap himself around it because, around him because he was so cold. And the doctor comes to him and he touches his hands and says, you're warm. And, and the young man says, no, doctor, I'm very cold. And, and the doctor says to the, to the nurse, give him some blankets, cover him up and take him out of this room. Oh, she was not going to take any chances. She, she took the blanket and she threw it at him. And he took the blanket and he covered himself. And the, the thing was that when, when he opened his eyes, he was not lying down. He was sitting in the bed. How he got to that position, he has no idea. So they took him to the treatment room next door and they began to examine him. So the doctor did a complete examination on him. He's still sitting there, covered in a blanket. And the doctor says, nothing's wrong with you. Your vitals are perfect. Everything is perfect. There's absolutely nothing wrong with you. He said, you know, I don't understand what's happened to you. What happened here? This young man, without even thinking, answered the doctor. He said, Jesus did it. And the doctor said, if you say Jesus did it, I believe it. Because it couldn't be my gods. This doctor was a Hindu doctor. See, he was the kind of doctor where whenever somebody is, uh, any of his patients are beyond medical care help, he would run to his Hindu temple and he would present offerings there and he would pray that his uh, patients would do, would do well and will recover. Unfortunately, you know, they all died. All the ones, he, he said, every time I prayed for my patients, they all died. So what's the point? They all die anyway. So he said, he said, you're the first of my patients. I didn't pray for you. You died. Five hours later, you are alive. And all you can say is Jesus did it. I believe it. I believe it because it couldn't be my God's. That doctor eventually gave his life to Jesus Christ. Yeah. Yeah. And that young man is standing in front of you today. Yeah. I am that young man. Would you give Jesus the praise? Give Jesus the praise. Don't worry, I'm very much alive right now. But what Jesus did for me, He can do for you. Amen. He gave me a second chance at life so that I can stand before people today and tell them that the God that we serve is a great God, a mighty God. And if you believe Him, nothing is impossible. God can raise the dead. If God can raise me from the dead, think of your problem. Is your problem bigger than mine? I mean, I, I was gone. <laughs> I was gone. But God decided that it is not yet time. Yeah? I had to meet this young lady. We were together already, but I had to marry this young lady, I mean. I've known my wife since I was 15 years old. Yeah. This happened when I was 17. So, you know, God saw in my future three children. God saw in my future a church. God saw in my future my grandchildren. God saw in my future all of you here today. And He, by His grace, gave me a second chance so that I can tell people, hey, what's your problem? How big is your problem? If you're not dead, your problem is not big. Because, you, you know, once you're dead, you're dead. 
You did. That, that, that's the end. No more problems after that. Right? You go straight to be with Jesus. But, but God was showing, God wants to show all of you today. If you dare to trust Him, He can do miracles for you. What did I do? I just cried out from the depth of my heart. I couldn't even speak. No, Jesus, help me. I don't want to die. Did I say some, some big prayer? Did I, did I give some eloquent prayer? No, it was just a simple cry of help. That's all that God needs from you. You just believe Him. And then God will perform the miracle. Amen. Amen. So today, how many of you would say, Pastor, pray for me? I am believing God for something and I'm trusting Him for a breakthrough in my life. And I want to see Him perform a miracle. Anybody here? Can I see your hands? Anybody here who needs prayer today? Who You are believing God for a miracle. Come on, can I see your hand? Anybody here? Anybody else? Yeah? You're believing God for a miracle. Yeah? You're believing God for the supernatural to happen in your life. Nothing is too hard for God to do. I want you all to stand with me right now. Can I just ask the keyboard player to come and join me? Thank you. Today, God is here. God is in this place. We sang that song just now, Waymaker, Miracle Worker, Promise Keeper. Light in the darkness. That is who you are. That is who you are. Our God is the miracle working God. Amen. He's the way maker. Perhaps you can't see a way out of your situation. Perhaps you can't see a way out of your condition right now. Maybe you feel hopeless. Maybe you feel helpless. Maybe you just can't see beyond what you're going through right now. But the good news is this. God has not changed. He's not moved His address. It's still Jeremiah 33. 3. Call unto me and I will show you great and mighty things. Amen. You call unto Him. He will do it. What is it that you're believing God for? What is it that you're hoping for? I want to pray for you today. I want to invite you. If you need prayer, take a step. Step out of your seat. Just come up here. Join me up here. Because I want to pray.